Okay, our last class, um, the doctrine of the future uh, we'll be talking about. Again, these classes are all available on the, the internet. Uh, there are three courses from the other two, or three classes from the other two courses that we did not get the video for, for various technical reasons, like Ross forgot to bring the camera one day. Um, but we will get those done and get those back up if you've missed those, all right? Um, let's talk about the doctrine of the future, or as it's more commonly known, the doctrine of last things or eschatology. Um, eschatology is, is a, from the Greek word eschaton, which means the last, and logia, which of course means the study of, it's from logos, which means the word, but it means the study of, or the focus on, that sort of thing. So eschatology is the study of the last thing, the future how things are going to end. Christian eschatology is concerned with the study of the end of all things, including the end of life, the end of the age, the end of the world, how all of this is gonna get wrapped up in the end. What is God's plan for the conclusion of time as we know it, and of existence as the human race and earth has known it? Um, it's important here to, to point out that Christianity is inherently an historical religion more so than any other religion. Our faith as Christians is built upon particular acts of God in history. This is also true for the Jews. The fact that God called Abraham, a particular person at a particular time in history, that God miraculously brought the, the Israelites out of captivity in Egypt, um, that he gave the law to a man, Moses, who became the leader of the Israelites that he gave them the promised land, all of these historical events. And then the ultimate fulfillment of God's historical plan is in the, the incarnation of Jesus Christ as a man some 2,000 years ago. Without a very specific historical sense that is true, much more so true than any other belief system, you know, other than Judaism, and to somewhat, uh, somewhat in the same sense, Islam, because Islam was a revelation given to a particular man in history. But not quite as much, because the, the idea that uh, even Muhammad was not divine, he was not a savior, but that God himself has actually entered into history, and that is the core of our faith, means that Christianity is historical in a way that no other religious beliefs are. And our belief is not only that God has involved himself with the history of the world, and especially the history of the human race in the past, but that that involvement in historical sense will continue into the future. So when we talk about Christian eschatology, we're talking about the beliefs within the Christian theology of how God's involvement in the history will continue into future history. That's very simply. And again, Christianity is more um, historical than any, any other religion. Um, and some people, some scholars and historians have said that there's an extent to which Christianity in many ways actually gave rise to the very idea of history. Because the movement of events in history, in terms of there being a cumulative kind of impact, um, is, a, is a fairly uniquely Judeo-Christian idea. Um, the idea of what history is, or what time even is, differs from uh, parts of the world to parts of the world, and especially from religion to religion. Whether it's cyclical, you know, just a constant repetition in a cycle, as some of the Eastern religions maintain, or that Greek religion maintain, um, or whether it is kind of a meaningless one darn thing after another, which is a fairly secular idea that's common today, Christianity has the view that God created time and introduced time at the creation of the physical universe, and that that time has been a progressive accumulation of events all within God's divine will uh, up until the present, and will continue in that sort of cumulative intentional planning of God until the point in which that is all uh, fulfilled in his, in his expectation. Um, that's quite different than most other concepts. I'll read you a quote here. This is from Carl F. H. Henry. He said, In contrast to the Greeks, to whom the idea of history was fundamentally foreign, the Greeks, even though Herodotus invented history, until uh, written history, as we understand it, the Greeks did not have the same sense of history as a cumulative progression of intentional events that we have. Uh, the Greeks to whom the idea of history was fundamentally foreign and who sought nothing of perpetual and abiding significance in history, that's why history wasn't invented until the 5th century BC by Herodotus, 
and later Euripides added to that idea, um, that never occurred to them before that it was of particular significance. Um, the Hebrew prophets knew that history is the realm in which God <coughs> decisively acts and works out his purposes. The Bible throughout insists that God the Creator holds mankind eternally accountable for every thought, word, and deed, and that each successive generation moves toward a final future in which the God not only of creation but also of redemption and judgment will consummate human history in the light of his divine offer of salvation. All of this is part of God's plan, and that plan is one that has been unfolding in history. And again, Christianity is fairly unique in that, and in many ways could be said almost Judeo, the Judeo-Christian idea to have invented history in that way. And so, because history is such an emphasis, it's very natural that Christian, uh, Christians have long been asking questions like, well, how will this end? What is the future history going to be? Um, critical aspects of Christian eschatology, of consideration of where God is going with his divine history, include uh, questions about the nature of death, the intermediate state, meaning between physical life as we know it and the eventual consummation of all things, for instance, for those people who die now. Heaven, hell, the return of Jesus, the resurrection of the dead, the rapture, the great tribulation, the millennium, the end of the world, the last judgment, the new heaven, and the new earth or the world to come. All of these are the kinds of issues that are dealt with within the category or the discipline known as eschatology. Okay? Now, some of these, if you are if you're in the Revelation class last week from our general epistles of Revelation, you will have seen a couple of these things because obviously when we talk about eschatology, the book of Revelation is critical to that. Revelation, along with Daniel and a number of other places, um, interestingly enough, you might be surprised to hear that every book in the New Testament, except Galatians and first and um, first, second, and third, or second and third John, I'm sorry, and Jude, every other book in the New Testament talks about the return of Jesus. So to that extent, every book in the New Testament, except Galatians and three of the shortest books, all talk about the return of Jesus, which is a primary eschatological issue. And so it's a huge part of all of Scripture. Uh, the book of Daniel is almost all eschatological, talking about what is to come in the future and how God will you know, wrap things up, if you will. But this chart gives you sort of four different um, versions of what people believe is going to happen in the future. Now, these are things about which people of good faith and good intention completely disagree. And it's because of taking different different passages, or even all the passages, from Revelation, from Daniel, there's some stuff from Ezekiel, passages in 1 Thessalonians and elsewhere, which talk about how things are going to end, and how do you interpret some of those. There's no place in Scripture where it says, okay, this is going to happen first, and it's going to last this long, and then the next thing that's going to happen is, there are passages that refer to a millennium reign of Christ. There are passages that refer to a great tribulation. There are passages that refer to a rapture, where the church is called up you know, to be with Jesus. But nowhere does it say exactly how those things are supposed to happen, and so people have interpreted that differently. Four of these options, I'm not going to spend a lot of time with them, I'll give you another uh, slide here in a second. The post-tribulation premillennialism, the idea that the tribulation, the great trying uh, time of trying, will happen before the second coming of Jesus, and then there will be a thousand year reign of Christ on earth, and then the last judgment. So that's post-tribulation premillennialism, which means God, uh, Jesus will come back after the tribulation, but before the thousand-year reign. The second uh, category up here, pre-tribulation or premillennialism, which is the dispensationalist idea. They actually have Jesus coming back twice. Jesus comes back to rapture the church. Then we have the tribulation. Then we have Jesus coming back again with the church to start the thousand-year reign, which then leads up to the Last Judgment. So that's pre-trib, pre-millennialism. And by the way, as far as I'm concerned, you don't have to remember this stuff. Uh, Wayne Grudem does an extensive job in, in the textbook dealing with all of this and good on it. I have neither the patience nor the, the energy to get into all that kind of detail, all right? Because we don't know. I'll say that right in the middle of this. We simply don't know. And yet, there are some Christians for whom, if you don't agree with them, that they're 
they are pre-trib, post-millennial, or whatever, then they're, they're really seriously doubt whether you're a Christian. You know what? Get a little humility, people. It's not clear. That's why people of good faith disagree on this stuff. The third version here, post-millennialism, simply says that there will be a thousand-year reign, which is believed to be the time in which Jesus, you know, uh, the truth of Jesus, the message of Jesus is available and is succeeding and is spreading, but then Jesus doesn't actually return physically until the end of the millennium, at which time there's the last judgment. And then the last one here at the bottom is amillennialism, which means that the millennium is not a specific real thousand years, but rather that it is a symbolic, you know, thousand is often used in scripture and in a lot of ancient texts as being just meaning a big number, okay? Thousand, if it says a thousand years, that means a lot. When it says a day is as 10,000 years, 10,000 years is a day, it doesn't literally mean 24 hours is the same as you know, 10,000 annum, okay? Um, those numbers, thousand, 10,000, simply mean a lot. So amillennialism suggests that the millennium is symbolic and that we are in it now, that since the coming of the Holy Spirit, which was the start of the church age, that this is the millennium which, in which the gospel of Christ will be preached and received. John. Is there a, is there a, a, a rapture in the post-millennialism view? Yes, that's at the end of the millennium. I see. The second coming would be the time of the rapture. I got you. Yeah. So let me, let me give you, uh, again, very quickly, amillennialism says that the thousand years referred to in Revelation is a symbolic number, and that we currently are in the millennium, which means the church age, the time between the giving of the Holy Spirit to the church and the return of Christ. Premillennialism is the belief that Jesus will return and physically be on earth for the thousand year reign, a literal interpretation of Revelation 20, and that can be either post or pre-trib. Um, I agree with Grudem when he says that there is no, there is no, doc, no, there is no scriptural justification for pre-tribulation rapture. I'm sorry dispensationalists, sorry. But um, I think it's wishful thinking. I think that it is thinking that we won't have to go through it. There really are no scriptures that advocate clearly that uh, Jesus will call the church up so that we don't have to go through the tribulation. Okay. Then there is post-millennialism, the idea that Jesus will return after a thousand year golden age, during which time it's, it's the golden age because the gospel will be preached and received, even though Jesus is not physically present, during which Christian ethics prosper, prosper and Again, there are different opinions as to whether that thousand years is a literal thousand years or a figurative thousand years. So you get some ideas about some of the differences. Also in Revelation, we talked about four different interpretive approaches to Revelation. Again, Revelation is the most significant document we have in Scripture that talks about the end times or eschatology. Going through them quickly because a number of you are in that class, uh, the four different approaches to end times uh, is historicism is the first one. That is to see that Revelation represents a broad view of history. And when we say Revelation, it's Revelation and other biblical prophecies. For instance, um, Daniel, when he talks about a vision of the four, you know, the four, um, either the four beasts or the vision of the statue that is made of four different materials, um, and part of that is interpreted as being kingdoms that are going to be coming. Uh, but the historicist would say that these reflect, Revelation and Daniel, for instance, reflect a broad view of all of history. The preterist view says that all of what Revelation refers to and that what Daniel refers to all are events in the past, that they were especially in the apostolic age, the first century. The last of the apostles was John, and he died around 100 or a little bit before that. Okay? The third view is futurist. A futurist interpretive view of Revelation is that all of Revelation describes future events, none of which have yet been fulfilled. So when it talks about the Antichrist, it's not Adolf Hitler, it's not Joseph Stalin, it is not, you know, uh, one of the popes, um, you know, Lorenzo de' Medici, who became pope, or any of those people, which have been in various interpretations, but rather all of it is yet to come. Then the idealist or symbolic which is sort of the, you know, the interpretive approach that matches up with amillennialism, is that Revelation does not actually refer to specific or real people or events, but it's an allegory for spiritual path, ongoing struggle between good and evil. In fact, all of these are symbols, uh, you know, visual symbols for spiritual realities, in other words. So those are four different interpretive approaches. And as I told the Revelation class, uh, I tend to be more of a futurist, believing that all of this is yet to be unfolded. But I don't know that for a fact. 
Again, we have to have some humility. We do know, to say John, we do know that um, Jesus said we don't know the hour or the day. And some people try to dance around that with, with sophistry and say, oh, well, we may not know the hour of the day, but we can know the month and year. <laughs> Hogwash. Jesus was very clearly saying, if, you have, if someone tells you they know when he's coming back, that they know when the end of time is going to be, when the consummation is, de facto, they're wrong. The very fact that they say they think they know means they're wrong. Because he says no one knows. Jesus even said, even I don't know, but only the Father in heaven knows. John? You know, I get it. I get it. The futurist, I get that. But doesn't that kind of disqualify you from, from ever coming to a point where those events could happen before your eyes and you would not recognize them? Oh, sure. I'm quite sure that a lot of these things, you know, because some of them are clearly symbolic. I mean, especially in Daniel, you know. Um, a lot of this stuff, I think, is going to happen and we won't recognize it. I don't, the thing, when I say I'm more of a, more of a futurist, and I, because I'm, I admit I don't know for sure. And I don't think any really honest theologian does claim to know for sure. Um, I believe that, well, all I'm saying is that I, I can't see anything that's happened in the past that seems to be your actual fulfillment of that. Okay, and yeah, I can pick a half a dozen things. You know, a half a dozen um, antichrists. But being being a futurist does not close the door on something that could occur in my lifetime. It does not eliminate eliminate me from recognizing. No, all it means is that it hasn't happened in the past. And when we say in the past, that means first century, you know, 1940s in Germany or whatever. It could have happened yesterday, and I haven't heard about it yet. You know, I just, it just means most of this will unfold uh, between whatever we are now and the future, okay? But we'll find out, you know. So, but I think an important part about this, um, when we, it's natural, especially because of the historical nature of Christianity, for us to ask the questions, how is all this going to end? Um, and Christians do not agree about this. People of good faith who honestly are trying to interpret Scripture uh, faithfully disagree about whether it's, you know, post-trib, pre-millennial, pre-trib, pre-millennial, amillennial, da, da 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 And that's why I say we have to have some humility about it. The bottom line is this is not, these are not the critical issues. The thing that we have to recognize is that while Christians are not in agreement about a lot of this stuff, the really important parts about the end times, we do agree on. And I think it's much more important for us to focus on those, not just because we agree on them, but because they are more important. And so I want to spend the next few minutes talking about the things that we do agree on. No matter what you think about the millennium, whether Jesus will be back for it, or it's just his spirit present, whether you believe we're going to go through the tribulation or not, those things don't really matter. We're going to find out. You know, if we go through the tribulation, we'll, we'll be aware of it. Okay. Uh, but... Let's talk about the things that people are in agreement on. I have one thing on here that people aren't in agreement on, but uh, we'll, we'll get into that. What do we believe about the future? And here I'm saying we, meaning virtually all evangelical Christians. There are some people clearly who claim the name of Christ who don't believe anything in Scripture, who don't have any sense of any theological um, expectations for God working in history, either in the past or in the future. So the first thing that there is pretty much universal agreement, at least amongst the evangelical Christians, is that Jesus is coming again. Whether he comes before the millennium, after the millennium, before the tribulation, after the tribulation, or both, you know, um, there is pretty much universal acceptance that Jesus is coming again. Some of the verses that are related to that are, and, and I, list, I list more of them, by the way, here, if you want to... All of this stuff, again, as always, is available online. So you can go and look this stuff up. Uh, I've got a lot more verses here, but let me give you just three of them. Acts 1, 10 to 11. This is right after the resurrection, well, after the ascension of Jesus. Uh, the disciples are out there and watching him as he goes up into the sky, and it says, they were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking up into the sky? Duh. The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Then 1 Thessalonians 4. And this is, 
this is a passage, a little bit more than this, but this is a passage in Thessalonians. I often have used it in memorial services. And the Lord knows that we have way too many memorial services here, uh, given our age group. But in 1 Thessalonians 4, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. And then Hebrews 9, just as people are destined to die once, by the way, this is why we do not believe in reincarnation in Christian faith. It is a point, I, I always quote the King James, you know, most of the scripture verses I learned, I learned in the King James. For it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. Which means we don't, you know, the transmigration of soul, reincarnation, is not compatible with Christian doctrine. Okay? And it, I know I used to be fascinated by this. I've read all the stories of children in India who knew everything about somebody who died the day they were born, and blah, 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 blah. Well, there are mysterious things in the world. I don't, I don't question the nature of the supernatural and mysterious. I just say reincarnation is not part of God's plan. According to what scripture says. Okay, just got to have all these little mini sermons as we go along, okay? Just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many, and he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting on him. There is overwhelming evidence in scripture of the expectation, the certainty, and the critical importance of the return of Jesus. Um, as I mentioned to you, every book in the New Testament except Galatians, 2nd, 3rd John, and Jude, the little tiny books, they all refer, to some extent, to the return of Jesus. It is that critical. In fact, if you average it out, one in every 25 verses in the New Testament refers to the return of Jesus. Okay? I would think this is a major issue. This is one we should know about. It's mentioned 318 times in the New Testament, and the New Testament has 260 chapters in it, which means that on average it, it's uh, referred to about one and a half times per chapter in the Bible. Okay, so there are much. There's much more emphasis on the return of Jesus in both the Old and New Testament. I mean, when it talks about the coming of you know, the son of David in the Old Testament, there are a lot of references to, you know, God's appointed one, you know, coming. There are far more references to Jesus' return the second time as the king of glory than there is about his initial nativity as a human baby. You know, we're used to at Christmas time focusing on all those passages from Isaiah and elsewhere that talk about, you know, uh, and a virgin will be with child, etc., and yet there's far more, not only in the New Testament, but even in the Old Testament, references to the fact that the, the appointed one of God will return in power and in glory, then there is references to him being born as a human baby. So we need to recognize the significance of this, and this is why there are no evangelical or no serious you know, Christians who don't agree that a fundamental principle, a major tenet of our belief in the end times, is that Jesus is going to come back. Um, and Jesus talked about his own return many, many times. I don't have any of the Jesus quotes here, but he said things like, Whoever's ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him um, will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And on and on and on. Jesus talked a lot about his own return. Okay, So we need to recognize that Paul's letters are full, as you see here in Thessalonians, are full of references to the coming. The Philippians is another. In Philippians, Paul also says, but our commonwealth is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, a Savior from heaven, in other words, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will change our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power which enables him even to subject all, subject all things to himself. Peter refers to the return of Christ as our living hope. Paul refers to our blessed hope. John declares with strong conviction, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him. Everyone who pierced him and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Over and over and over again. All of Scripture acknowledges that Jesus will return, and that that will be the ultimate culmination of all of God's historical plan for his creation. All right? Um, so that's the first tenet that we have to recognize 
that we agree on and that is fundamental to our belief in the end times. The second is the resurrection of the saved, but also the resurrection of the unsaved. Um, we believe that all people will come back from the grave. Christianity is quite unique again amongst religions. And by the way, one of the things that caused me to become a Christian was when I realized that virtually every other religious system, every other philosophy, when you boiled it down, basically said the same thing with one major exception. Christianity is different because it said that we cannot by our own efforts improve ourselves. We cannot lift ourselves up by our own bootstraps. God only can make us better in the way we need to be made better. So Christianity is unique in that way. But Christianity is also unique in, in that among all the religions of the world, most religions have some concept of the eternity of the soul or whatever spiritual aspect. Now, there are, there are exceptions to that. The, the view in Buddhism and some other Eastern religions of nirvana, which literally means nothingness, where you know, the, highest, the highest achievement you can attain is to no longer exist. Um, there's something, I think, in humanity that rebels against that idea. Uh, but the, the idea of um, that Christian Christianity is not only that our souls or spirits will last forever, depending upon how you perceive that humans are di dichotomous or trichotomous, the soul and the spirit are the same thing, but that we will, our spiritual essence will not only live forever, but our bodies will live forever. Christianity alone says that we will have a physical resurrection and that our bodies also will be eternal. And so when we talk about the resurrection of the saved and of the unsaved, we're talking about the physical resurrection of the body and the reunion, for those who have died earlier, the reunion of their physical bodies with their spirit. Okay? Some of the verses related to that. In first, the resurrection of the saved. 2 Corinthians 4, since we have that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. We will be raised as well. 1 Corinthians 15, so will it be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable. It, will, it is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. All of this having to do with the resurrection. In Revelation 21, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among his people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. The idea that we will continue to live after our death, after the destruction of all things, we will still live in a, in a resurrected state in the presence of God forever. And it will be in a perfected body so that there is no more death or mourning or crying or pain. Okay? Yeah, that's one of my very favorites. This is another passage I often use, probably even more often than the First Thessalonians message in memorial services. But that is the hope that we look forward to. Okay? But, unfortunately, it, it would be nice if we could just stop there. But we can't. There is also clearly indications of the resurrection of the unsaved or of the condemned. John 5 says, Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done what is good will rise to live. Those who have done, done what is evil will rise to be condemned. And you need to understand, and John is particularly clear about this, when it says, if you, uh, those who have done good will rise to live. Those who have done uh, evil will rise to be condemned. The ultimate good is accepting Jesus Christ. The ultimate evil is to reject God in Jesus Christ. So... That's the, the, the big breaking point there. Now, we're going to talk about judgment in a minute and what that amounts to. But again, back to Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians 1 says, God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you. Um, Paul here is talking to Thessalonians who are suffering persecution. And give relief to you who are troubled and to us as well. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might on the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people and to be marveled at amongst all those who have believed. Okay? Um, now, the idea of resurrection has a number of very important theological uh, consequences that we may not think about. First of all, the idea of Christian resurrection clearly states to us that death is an enemy. 
God's original plan in creation was not that we would die. Death was introduced when sin was introduced into the world. And since that time, death has always been the enemy. This is why Jesus, when he died, he physically was resurrected and defeated death, the great enemy. The sword of Damocles that hangs over the head of every person. And um, so we need to recognize that death in God's ultimate plan for things is unnatural and originally was unintended. And our doctrine of the resurrection of both the saved and unsaved is clearly an indication that death is an enemy that will be defeated. That's important to us because as we all face death, trying to deny death does not help. Instead, we need to recognize death as the consequence of sin in the world, but to know that that is not the end. And for those of us who are in Christ, we will overcome that. We will defeat death. The ultimate victory will come to those who are in grace, as we are all raised from the dead, and those who are saved or in Christ Jesus to life. So it's critically important for us to understand this theologically as we understand our own lives and how to live them. The idea of the resurrection of the dead, that we will all be raised, is important when we recognize that, that when this life is over, it's not finished. There's more to come. Carolyn has said that when she dies, as a Christian who's also a marketing person, you know, Carolyn is marketing, she wants her tombstone to say, but wait, there's more. <laughs> okay? <laughs> and if, heaven forbid, she goes first, I'm planning to do that for her. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> you can change your mind later, I guess. But, but the idea is that as we live this life, understanding that this, this, this life is not all there is, it gives us a perspective that will change how we live this life. That um, we are in, we're in preparation for the life to come. And that gives us a perspective on this that I think is very different. Um, now, the next aspect that we all agree is coming, we being evangelical Christians, is uh, the coming judgment. After the resurrection of the saved and unsaved, there is judgment that is coming. And that judgment will be both for the saved and the unsaved. The indication in Scripture is that the first act of judgment is we all stand before the great white throne. And this is one of the areas that I think, that in, um, in fact, every time I talk about this now, I feel like I'm picking on you. Well, I'm not. Um, dispensationalism, because of an effort to try to clarify the different dispensations or eras, Dispensationalists, traditional dispensationalists, actually say that there are going to be three different returns of Jesus, or actually three different judgments. The judgment of the church, the judgment of the, those who were not the church, and then the I don't even know what the third one is. <laughs> um, and I think that, you know, we, have to, we go through contortions to try to make everything fit into a system then. Um, I believe, and the traditional evangelical view, is that there is one coming judgment, when both the righteous and the unrighteous will be called before the great white throne of judgment, on which Jesus will sit, the one whom God the Father has, has uh, given authority for this judgment. The first aspect of that judgment that occurs is that those whose books, the books of life will be opened, and those whose names appear in the book of life, meaning they have accepted re reconciliation to God in Jesus Christ, and they will be saved, those whose book is not in the, whose name is not in the book of life, will be condemned and will be sent off to the one location in which the presence of God will not be available to them, and that is in the lake of fire prepared for the devil and his demons. Notice it's not in Matthew 25. It's not that the lake of fire or hell was not prepared for people. It was prepared for the devil and his demons. But since that's the only place that God's presence will not be, those who choose against God will take up residence in the one place where God's presence is not known, and that is the lake of fire with the devil and the fallen angels. And as C.S. Lewis brilliantly said, that it is not that God sends people to hell. At the very end, ultimately, God will, allow, God will give people what they have asked for. Those who have said they do not want to be in a relationship with God or in His presence by their decisions, God will give them what they ask for, and He will, send, he will allow them at that point, they won't have a choice, but he will allow them to go to the one place where his presence will not be, and that is hell. In the same way, salvation is not the cash bonus that's at the end of the road for those people who have accepted Jesus, but rather it is where the road that they have chosen takes them. Okay? But there is a judgment. Acts 17.31 says, For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man, that is Jesus, he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. 2 Corinthians 5. So we make it our goal to please Him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. 
For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done well in the body, whether good or bad. Remembering the first good that we can do is accepting reconciliation of God in Christ. The first bad or evil that we can do is to reject God. Now, there's an indication, this is just to the passage, there's indi there are indications that for those who are in Christ and we stand before the throne, and Grudem goes into great detail, much more detail than I would, about rewards. You know, he talks about given, given authority over cities, various other, other kinds of things in, uh, in the afterlife. To me, first we need to recognize that even for those who are saved, there will be judgment. Where, where what we have done in our lives will be made manifest. It will be seen. And we won't be able to hide those secret sins and evils anymore. To me, the judgment and the reward or punishment that will happen for those who are saved in, the, for, in front of the great white throne is very simple. Those who are saved and are in Christ, who have accepted Him sincerely, will be present with Him in heaven for eternity. But if after accepting Him they did not live their lives well, in other words, if they were not good children, if they did not, if they were not obedient in the way Jesus wanted them to, even if they accepted him, I believe that Jesus will say, You are my child, you are part of my family, you will be with me for eternity. But you were not a good child. And I think the shake of Jesus' finger in our face, and to hear the disappointment in his voice, will be the most heartrending thing that we could ever imagine experiencing. There will be joy in the morning. There will be a time, you know, we will get over that. But for that moment, I believe that is the judgment, the punishment for those who have not been good children, but who have accepted Christ. And then we will, you know, that will be gone, there will be eternal joy. But the greater joy at the final judgment will be for those who, when their lives are reviewed, Jesus can look at them and smile and say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And there will be no treasure no victory, no success, no joy that could ever be as important to us, as valuable to us, as meaningful and satisfying to us as that. So to me, the evaluation, the judgment, and the evaluation even for Christians, for those who have accepted Christ, will be either you are not a good child, which will be heartrending, although we will get over it, we will be with him in heaven, or it will be, well done, thou good and faithful servant, and there will be no greater celebration of joy in our hearts than that. Bob? How does this fit in with verses like, I will remember your sins no more, as far as the east is from the west? And exactly. I, I, and, and, uh, there is no, therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We are not condemned for that, um, for, for those things. But there is a difference. I mean, you know, and Garun goes into great detail about the fact that they, the Scripture talks about rewards, that there will be greater rewards. To me... And Grudem says, if that's the point, then if that's the point for you, then you're missing the point. That that's not the orientation we ought to have. And yet the danger is too great for us when we start talking about, okay, well, I gave command for five kingdoms, you know, kind of thing. Our human nature being what it is. Our sins will not be remembered. We are saved in Him. The issue is, can Jesus declare joy in how we have fulfilled our, our call in our lives or can he, will he express disappointment for us? There will be no condemnation. There will be no judgment. We, we are in Christ's will and, and, and the, the disappointment of that, if we have not fulfilled God's you know, perfect will for us, Jesus' perfect will for us, will be brief. It will be very temporary. And then there will be the joy of heaven in which none of that will be remembered anymore. But clearly, Scripture says that everyone, the righteous and the unrighteous, in fact, the passages where Paul is talking about the coming judgment, you know, where, you know, like in 2 Corinthians, when he says, uh, each will receive what is due for us for things done in the body, he's talking to Christians when he says that. Okay? He's not talking to unbelievers. And so clearly, all of the passages that talk, well, almost all of the passages that talk about a judgment to come and that we will be evaluated are, are were written to Christian churches. And again, it is not a condemnation. It is not that our sins will be held against us, but I believe Jesus from his heart of hearts will tell us whether, whether how we lived our lives after we accepted him was pleasing to him or not. Okay? Now, I'm not going to hang ultimate value on that, but that's how I believe those scriptures are indicated, uh, what those scriptures indicate. Okay? So we agree on those things. No matter whether you're pre-trib, post-trib, pre-millennial, post-millennial, amillennial, pan-millennial, which means you think it's all going to pan out in the end, you know that. 
Jesus is coming. There will be resurrection, both the saved and unsaved. There will be judgment. There is a fairly universal agreement on the idea that there then will be heaven for those who have accepted Christ. There is far less agreement on the fact that there will be a hell for those who have rejected Christ. Now again, evangelicals, Scripture is pretty clear about that. Uh, um, evangelicals would accept both heaven and hell. A lot of other folks really waffle at the hell idea. And even evangelicals, some of them have become, in recent years, have been much more of a move toward annihilationism. Annihilationism says that those who have rejected Christ, that they will spend a period of time experiencing the, the torment of hell, but then they will be annihilated, meaning they will be completely destroyed and no longer suffer. And there are a number of different reasons for that. Some of them have to do with fairly artificial interpretations of what it means about the destruction of the wicked. Does that mean annihilation or does it mean sending to hell? There, is, there are some who say that it's inconsistent with the love of God that somebody would be punished eternally. It's also, some people say that it seems inconsistent, um, more philosophically than theologically, that, temp, that sins that were done in time, which means over a short, you know, during a period of time, would then be con, uh, punished by eternal condemnation and suffering. It's not just condemnation, it actually is suffering. Okay? All of those kinds of ideas have led more and more people to go toward the, the direction of an annihilationism, that after some period of punishment, that the, even the wicked will be annihilated, their souls will be no more. Part of us want that. You know, nobody likes the idea of even bad people having to suffer torment, you know, horrendous torment, forever, with no end. And part of us does want to say, that seems inconsistent with the love of God. And yet, there really is no way to justify that from Scripture, the doctrine of annihilationism, without twisting things a lot. Um, and so I'm satisfied with saying I know that God is a good and loving God. I know that He is a righteous and holy God, that those who have rejected Him and are deserving of punishment will be punished. How they will be punished in light of God being a loving God, I simply don't know what that means. But I'm not going to develop a, or accept somebody else's idea of a theological doctrine that I can't find support in Scripture simply because we don't like the idea of God punishing people forever. John? Isn't the waffling of hell and the, 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 the challenge that it exists, isn't that kind of a contemporary thing? Yeah, I mean, there have been heretics back. Yeah, there's always been. There's, there's always been some. I mean, wouldn't you, wouldn't you say maybe that's become, that's a more modern, contemporary church attitude sure. than it has in the past in the history of the church? And the reason is because I just said, you know, what does Scripture say? And the idea of annihilationism or not accepting hell, the people who really advocate that either have not bothered to see what Scripture says about it, which is the characteristic of the modern church. We don't know the word God. Or, we have not taken it seriously. Even if we know what it says, we don't take it seriously. We go, oh, well, you know, that's, that's just, you know, that was there. We're smarter than that now. Progressive revelation means we understand things now that they didn't understand. Any sin in the book can be justified that way. Any heresy in the book can be justified by saying, well, that was for the primitive people, but we're more advanced than that. Well, horse hockey, we are not. We are not more advanced. We are not better. I had a long discussion with a couple not, not, not too long ago who said, well, humanity's better now than it used to be. And I said, where in the world do you get that? <laughs> oh, well, you know, we, and, and we talked and talked and talked. And I said, really? Uh, how long ago was it that Hitler tried to annihilate not only all the Jews, but, but gypsies and homosexuals and, you know, a dozen other kind of political, you name it. Um, Stalin killed 25 million people just because he could. Um, on and on and on and on and on. You know, serial killers is a modern invention. The reason why everybody in this room knows who Jack the Ripper was is he's the first one we ever documented. Because the idea of somebody killing people just because they wanted to kill somebody, not because they angered them or they stole from them or they, you know, they stole their girlfriend or whatever. The idea of killing somebody just because you wanted to kill somebody we invented that in the last 150 years or so. And people are getting better. What I finally got these folks to see, the couple I was talking to, is it's not that people have gotten better. It's that society has gotten better at policing it. You know, we stop people from doing a lot of the things that there didn't used to be systems to stop people from it. But our natural tendency is not getting better. If anything, it's getting worse. And yet, people don't want to buy that. They don't want to believe that. There's a belief that we're getting better and better, we're getting smarter and smarter. 
Um, we have this concept, for instance, um, a book that sometimes when you're feeling especially smart, you should read. G.K. Chesterton's The Everlasting Man. The first half of that book, uh, Chesterton, okay, you've already read it, right? People sort of write it down and they put the pins down and know they've read The Everlasting Man. The first half of The Everlasting Man has to do with the development of humanity. The second half of that book has to do with our understanding of Jesus. So Everlasting Man has two meanings. The idea of humanity being forever, but then Jesus truly being the everlasting man. One of the things that Chesterton observes, which shows you just how, how wrong we have our concepts of humanity, Chesterton says early in that book that we have this concept of caveman. When I say caveman, you know, or Neanderthal, what do you think? <laughs> club somebody, you know, club a woman over the head, drag her off by the hair to, to a cave, right? Chesterton says the only evidence we have of prehistoric cave dwellers is that they were extraordinary artists. The only evidence we have of what cave people were like before modern civilization or, or prehistoric is that they have this extraordinarily beautiful artistic talent. Do you ever think about that? And yet we're better than they are. We're smarter than they are. We're more capable than they are. We're more creative than they are. We have created this mythology about humanity, the history of humanity, to make ourselves feel superior. We're not. Okay? Where was I going with all that? Oh yeah, and it has to do with the idea that, well, we're, we're, the concept of hell is primitive. And if it's in scripture, it was written there for the primitive people, because they can only scare them out of doing the things that they shouldn't do. But they don't really mean hell. Yes, they do, the writers of scripture, but the inspiration of God, the Holy Spirit, they mean exactly what it says. We believe in heaven, the righteous reward for those who have accepted God in Christ. We believe in hell, the punishment for those who have chosen to reject him. And again, it's not that God gives a cash bonus of heaven or is angry and punishes people in hell. God allows us to go where we chose. He lets the road that we chose take us to the end, which is either heaven or heaven. Okay. So it is a fairly modern idea but only because we either don't know scripture or we don't we choose to not take it seriously because we don't like what it says. Can I get an amen? Amen. Okay, a couple more passages about heaven and hell. First, Revelation 21. This is that, you know, it's a larger version of that same passage. Uh, I think Revelation 21 is probably my favorite scripture. <laughs> there will last because I say that all the time. Uh, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem. That's us, by the way. We are the new Jerusalem. Coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, no mourning, or crying, or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. The new heaven. There is a place called heaven. Heaven is real. Okay? But unfortunately, so is hell. I say unfortunately because, not because I expect to spend any time there. I have faith that you know, Christ will, will save me. It's not because of my value, but his. But I say that because of grief for those who will experience it. Cannot but feel sorrow for those who choose wrong. Matthew 25. This is the great passage about the sheep and the goats. And then he will say to those on his left. Now this is right, by the way, this is right after Jesus said, I was hungry and you did not feed me. I was thirsty. You did not give me something to drink. I was, um, I was cold and alone and you did not clothe me or visit me in prison. And they said, when, Lord, they call him Lord, when, Lord, did we see you hungry or thirsty or unclothed or in prison? And he said, as much as you did not do it under one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did not do it for me. And then he says this, Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. It's real. 2 Peter 2, For God did not spare angels when they sinned, these are the fallen angels, in other words, but sent them to hell, putting them in chains of darkness to be held for judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on its ungodly people, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others, and there are a bunch more examples in this passage, but I skip ahead to the end. If this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials 
and to hold the unrighteous for punishment on the day of judgment. In Revelation 20.10, And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And again, the, old, the idea... Um, Annihilationists would say that the devil and his demons will be punished forever and ever. And in fact, some people have said that the reason why the devil and the fallen angels, there would be judgment of the angels too, by the way. I mentioned judgment of people. But it says the angels also will be judged. In fact, uh, the Jesus, in speaking to the apostles, said, do you not know that you will judge the angels? The fallen angels will be judged, and there is no, no possibility of salvation for the devil and his demons. And uh, Theologians have surmised, because it's not clear in Scripture, it doesn't say this anyway, that because the devil and his demons knew exactly what they were doing, they knew God face to face, they could not claim ignorance, they could not claim lack of clarity, they knew exactly what they were doing when they rebelled against God, then there is no redemption for them. Human beings, redemption is available because, you know, it's broken, weak, short-sighted, lost creatures. God has more mercy on us than the angels who have no had no excuse, who knew exactly what they were doing. Okay? And so therefore Jesus came and died, not for the angels, but for us. Right? This is what we believe about the end times. The eschaton, as it's called in the noun. Any questions about any of that? And again, you can disagree on the premillennial, pre postmillennial, pre-trib, post-trib, a-trib, non-trib, you know, um, whatever. These things are the things that we absolutely believe are unequivocal. That these are the universal beliefs. Judy? You're, talk, you're talking about just the fallen angels. Right. They will be judged. Well, we'll, we'll there'll be the judgment of the angels. Um, the indication is that it's the fallen angels will be judged. I don't think there's a need for, for God to judge that. Because it's not like the angels who have not fallen, the angels who have been faithful to God, that he's going to say, okay, you get to come to heaven. No, uh, they will continue as his messengers and servants. It is the fallen angels who experience judgment and at that point will be cast into the lake of fire that especially was prepared for them. Okay? Any questions? Would you like to take a 10-minute break and then we'll have the test?